Welcome back, everybody. My name is Mickey Emerson, and uh, this is Let's Summarize Ministries, a product of Christ-Centered Men. And today we are diving into the final uh, episode of the Judge Samson. So we got Samson, and we've in the previous episode we talked about his his life, his trials, his tribulations. Uh, leading up through the first part of his life, and now we're going to talk about the second part of his life. And so if we dig into the pages of Judges chapter 16, we get a glimpse into the tribulations and the fall of Samson, the final judge. We have a man within the book of Judges that was foretold by an angel of the Lord. He was anointed as a Nazarite to sacrifice himself and his life to the Lord, and he was given the gift of glorious strength. Uh, that he might use as a means to deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines and lead God's people down the straight and narrow path as a judge. What has taken place has been a life of debauchery, uh, womanizing, alcoholism, handling things that the Lord deems to be unclean. He was given this great strength by the Lord, yet he never seems to use it to glorify the Lord. Rather, he uses it to mock the Philistines and to be a show-off. As I mentioned in our previous episode, I, I pray that you watch that. If, if you haven't, please go back and check that out. There's so much to be said about Samson. Uh, chapters 13 through 16, the book of Judges. But as I mentioned then, you will see me shift back and forth between what I have to say about Samson. Sometimes I'm going to say he's a, he's a show-off. Sometimes I'm going to say you know what, God had a lot of mercy on him, and we can learn a lot from Samson. That's because we all live this life, all right? Ours just isn't put down on paper the way his is. And as I'm reading about Samson, as I'm writing about Samson, my thoughts and my attitudes fluctuate, and they change. So you'll, you'll get to see that as, as I talk about him. Now, the word of the Lord has this to say concerning gifts. In the book of Numbers, chapter 18, 20, uh, verse 29, all of your gifts shall offer every heave offering of Jehovah, of all its fat, the holy part of it, out of it. Uh, what we have been blessed with, essentially, is the healthy parts should be used to show gratitude to the Lord. Now, he has meant for us to cast, he was meant to cast out the Philistines, Samson was. Uh, yet, as soon as he was old enough to be a man, he ran straight to them. And he spent more time in their presence than he did in the presence of the Israelites, God's chosen people. At least that's what we see on the surface. Within the pages of the Bible, there is so much going on behind the scenes that we don't see and that we're not privy to. Now, conversations and situations that we don't see on the surface can be taking place that we know absolutely nothing about. So what kind of conversations was Pilate having with his wife while Jesus was being hauled off to King Herod? What sort of conversation was Barnabas and John Mark having after him and um, Paul had their disagreement and went their separate ways? You know, uh, what were the other apostles doing while Paul, Peter, and John were writing the New Testament? You know, uh, we, we don't really know. But productivity and God-glorifying activities can be going on that we simply do not see on the surface. With that being said, we do not know we don't know what was going on with Samson behind the scenes that may have been glorifying God and judging his people. What we have is what the prophet Samuel, upon inspiration from the God, uh, from God, saw necessary to relay to us. Now, at the tail end of chapter 15, we are told that Samson judged Israel for 20 years. This is where I struggle with my synopsis of the situation. Because with the previous judges, the time of judgment tends to come towards the end. Yet with Samson, we see it in the middle. It's in the middle of his biography. So after the slaying of the Philistines in, in Lehi, Lehi, however you'd like to pronounce that, it says that he judged Israel for 20 years. But then he fell apart once he met Delilah. Or had he judged Israel for 20 years up to that point? We don't really know, and I can't say for certain. I've done research, I've read commentaries, but nothing really seems to give a definitive answer. Uh, so what we do know is that within chapter 16, Samson makes his way to Gaza. It's a 25-mile strip of land that's uh, along the Egyptian border to the south, 
with Israel to the north and to the east, and he's made his way into the hotbed of Philistine activity for one reason or another that we're not given. Now, he's come to judge the Jews who live there, maybe. We don't know. Has he come merely to taunt the Philistines? You know, it, it doesn't say, but what it does say is that soon after he arrives, he took a, took a bed with a harlot. You know, those are not actions becoming of a judge. So while in bed, he's surrounded by the men of Gaza. And yet he escapes by ripping the city walls off, carrying them up a hill in order to intimidate them with his strength. I love the visual of this. Him just going out there, ripping city gates off this wall, screaming and running up this hill, you know, shaking his fists, throwing them down. And I, I, I just love it. But, yeah, you know, like, come at me, bro. I, I just, but that's, that's the visual that we get. But this must have been his cue to leave because it's after this, we see our hero, it'd be verse 4 of chapter 60, we could see our hero at the Valley of Sarek, which means red grapes in the Hebrew. Now, at the border, it's at the border of Dan, and that's where he meets his Achilles. That's where he meets the love of his life, Delilah. So we are not told why he was there, if he was there uh, for judgment for the people of Dan, or if he was merely playing the vagabond and uh, seeking to lay his head down someplace. We do know that he was of the tribe of Dan, so this may have been a community of friendly faces, unlike the 3,000 countrymen that had betrayed him earlier back in Lehi. You know, if we read on in uh, chapter 18 or in 1 Kings, we find that the Danites had abandoned God and the territory had become a mecca for idolatry. Uh, what we do know for certain is that he falls in love with this woman who would be used as a Trojan horse by the Philistines and would lead to his demise. Spoiler alert. So the enticing young lady, Delilah, is approached by the lords of the Philistines. This is where things are going to get really interesting. And this is to determine the root of Samson's, Samson's strength so that they may exploit it. Uh, now there are a total of five lords that you would find mentioned in the book of Judges chapter 3. All right, five, uh, five lords. And as well, you'll also see that in the book of Joshua chapter 13 verse 3. Now, I do believe, hailing from the southwestern Levant communities of Gaza, Eshkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath, uh, the city-states at the time, each of the lords are so desperate for the head of Samson that they each offered Delilah 1,100 shekels of silver. To give us, I'm going to give some context into how much money that is. To give you an idea... Uh, we are told later on in Judges 17, verse 10, uh, that 10 shekels of silver are the equivalent of a year's wage. 10. They're offering her 1,100 each. So, let's put that into perspective. This means that each lord offered this young lady 110 years worth of wages in exchange for Samson. That's 550 years worth of wages. Now, to put it into modern day terms, the average individual income in the United States is approximately $37,000 after taxes, give or take. And I think it's like 57,000 net, somewhere in there. But if you were to multiply that by the 550, you would come up with a total of 23 million, like 23, over $23 million in current U.S. currency. So we have a young lady who most likely grew up and lived in poverty. You know, um, she spends her days scraping by, quite possibly has no bright future ahead. And in exchange for 550 years worth of wages, she simply has to relinquish, relinquish the root of her boyfriend's strength so that the lords may bind him and afflict him. That's all they say they're going to do. Now, in the Hebrew, the word for afflict is belaw or wear out. They just want to wear him out. They want to beat him down. That's all they want to do. So as far as young Delilah is concerned, the lords will do nothing more than bind him, wear him out, in order to teach him a lesson because he has really been a thorn in the Philistines' side. And what would you do? $23 million. So there is no way that this young lady could pass up this kind of a payday. So what she do? She begins to woo him in exchange for the secret to his strength. Now verses 6 through 14 gets slightly comical. 
you know, in the right context. Because three times Delilah asks Samson the secret to his strength. And three times he lies to her. And all three times that she asks him, you know, <laughs> men are lying in wait in order to come in and seize him. And so that they can destroy him. But all three times, because he had lied to her each time about the secret of his strength. So he's lied to her and they come in to bind him, but he's lied. So his strength is still there. And so what does he do? He whoops them all three times. Now, this is just me, but if my wife were to ask me an incredibly compromising question that resulted in people bursting through the door in order to apprehend me, not once, not twice, but three times, I'd probably take a hint and hit the road. Yeah, I mean, that's just downright sketchy. But Samson apparently held great esteem for this woman. He had a great passion for Delilah because he stuck around. And he eventually gave her the secret to his strength. <sighs> anyway, he told, it's told that he told her all that was in his heart. And he informed her that he was a Nazarite to God and that a razor had never touched his head. At this point, she knew that he was sincere. And so she informs the lords who put the money in her hands. At this time, she likely got him drunk at night so that he would pass out on her knees, affording these gentlemen the opportunity to shave the seven locks of hair from his head. Now, unbeknownst to him, the Lord had departed from him. So when the perpetrators come in to seize him and he awoke, he was easily bound. So, truth be told, his strength did not lie in his hair. Our strength and our abilities do not lie within us. They're gifts from the Lord. They're, they are the Lord's to give and they are the Lord's to take away. You know, but we all will save that for a bit later. And I can only imagine the horror that Delilah felt as this whole situation begins to unfold. And he is not merely bound or worn out. But what do they do? They gouge out his eyes so that he can't see. That's what they do. They, they don't just beat him up and kick him around. They gouge out his eyes. They take his eyes from him. Maybe that was God's way of taking out the lust of his eyes that he'd had for all these women. I don't know. But Samson was immediately bound in bronze chains and he was made to be a grinder in prison. There's going to be a lot of irony that's, that's going to pick up here in a second. See, this once He-Man had been reduced to the equivalent of ox labor, not to mention a spectacle and a mockery for the people. You know, taunts, abuse, and I can only imagine how the Philistines must have loved the sight of this man who had for years made a spectacle of them, and now he's re reduced to this life of humility. He's reduced to a life of grinding grain as his punishment. Probably a uh, punishment for burning their grain fields that we saw back in chapter 15, verse 5. Like I said, a little bit of irony there. But within the final hours of his life, we're getting towards the end here. And please remember that I'm only giving you the what's on the surface. I, I encourage everyone to go out there, read, uh, read the book of Judges, read chapters 13 through 16 to get a glimpse into Samson. There's so much that we can glean uh, for, from these chapters. But within the final hours of his life, he is brought into the temple of Dagon. Dagon was a vegetation god, uh, and he had three temples. He had one in Gaza, uh, one in Ashdod, and one in Beth Shean. And uh, several thousand people had gathered for this celebration, that was, and they were in need of entertainment. We are told that he requested Samson. They requested Samson when they were in high spirits in order to entertain them. Uh, something that may have been a regular occurrence, or it may have been a first. We're not told. Again, we see a once man's man reduced to dancing and acting a fool for the sake of entertainment for these pagan Philistines. And during a pause in his activities, in a pause of the amusement, Samson asks this young man who's near him where the pillars are so that he may rest. He places his hands, his right hand, and his left hand on the pillars. And as he does, he prays to the Lord that he might be strengthened one last time. And we're told that his hair had started to grow back. 
Uh, but he's asked the Lord to be strengthened one last time so that he may avenge himself for the sake of his eyes and that may he, he may die with the Philistines. Maybe because he had spent more time with them than he had his own people, he felt that that's where he belonged. I don't know. But he had asked to go down with the Philistines. So he gives a great push, and the pillars that hold the temple up collapse, causing the temple to collapse, killing everyone inside, including Samson. His family comes, they collect his body, and they bury him in the tomb with his father. Thus were the days of Samson. Now, as I mentioned earlier, he was known for his great strength uh, due to his long hair, but his hair was not the source of his strength. I said that earlier, his faith was in the Lord and his strength was from the Lord. You know, while it's easy to point out the shortcomings of Samson, he is listed amongst the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, right there in verse 32. Um, and it's also easy to come down on Delilah. But for this modern day equivalent of 20 plus million dollars, just to make a sport of her boyfriend, you know, it's possible that she expected to receive the money, um, apologize, make up, and then run off and live happily ever after with, with the money that she had received. We don't really know, but there are so many what ifs pertaining to the life life of Samson, life of Delilah. And what we know for certain is that his life is applicable to ours, as are all of these wonderful individuals in Scripture. We, we can find us in just about all of them. So how often do we mingle with sin, just as Samson did with the Philistines? You know, How often do we put our faith in our mental or our physical prowess rather than in the Lord? And, you know, we were created in God's image and we were given the gift of the Holy Spirit in the event that you have been baptized for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, we may not hold on to these physical, finite things, and that's why we do that. So, we are called to give ourselves as a complete, living, and holy sacrifice. Book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 1, as the Apostle Paul tells us. And that includes our spiritual gifts, which were granted by God. So, dating back to the sin offering of Leviticus chapter 8. You know, we can deduct that the ceremonial and the meaningful aspects were different. So upon sacrifice, the entire portion is to be given to the Lord. But the death of the sacrifice was somewhat incidental. All right? His true concern was with the willingness of the sacrificee, all right? rather than with the sacrifice itself. He is more concerned with our willingness to do His will. And so what could, we, what could we possibly offer to the Lord that He cannot have for Himself? He created it. He doesn't need it. It's His. So His concern is with our willingness to be mindful of and to be generous with what we've been granted. And as I said before, there is much going on behind the scenes that we will never be privy to. And I'm confident that at the end of the day, God looked favorably upon Samson, regardless of what we are allowed to know about his life. He had to have looked favorably upon him because he answered his prayers at the end. And we know that God does not hear the prayers of the unrighteous. So he had to have been seen as a righteous man in the eyes of God. Now may we take this opportunity to be cognizant of what we have been given and do our absolute best not to take it for granted. All right. Please look at your spiritual gifts, your physical gifts. All right. What we do, we want to pray that we can use what we've been given to give glory to God to benefit those around us, and to show people the light that leads to the Lord. All right. So thank you all so much for joining us, so much for diving into the judges with us. Uh, and a uh, little teaser, what's going to be coming up after the judges, I'm going to dive into some obscure individuals in Scripture, individuals that we don't uh, hear much about, guys and gals that are given one verse or two verses or just a little tidbit of scripture that we don't really know about that they're in there for a reason and so we're, we're going to touch on some of these folks and uh, hopefully we'll learn a little bit about them and learn how they're applicable to our lives and they're applicable to the glory of God so thank you all for 
uh, listening. Thank you for tuning in, and all glory be to God. See us.